In this video we're going to continue to look at rotational motion, uh, but in this video we're specifically going to start to look at rotational mechanics. So kinematics was where we just described the rotational motion, uh, but now we're going to look at the causes of the rotational motion. Uh, so we're going to get into force and mass and things like that. So I'm showing you the same chart as in the first video, which shows the analogy between one-dimensional motion and rotation. So we already talked about the first three items on this list, right? Position is now being replaced by an angle. Velocity is being replaced by an angular velocity. And acceleration is now an angular acceleration. Okay. But now we're going to, as I say, we're going to start looking at more quantities. Mass, which is going to be replaced with a moment of inertia. And force, which is going to be replaced by a torque. And either in this video or in a, a follow-up video, uh, we're going to also talk about kinetic energy, which is not replaced, actually, but we just continue to talk about kinetic energy for rotation. OK, um, yeah, so let's start. Let's talk about the first one, mass, moment of inertia. So mass really is, was an object's resistance to being accelerated, right? A more massive object, you apply a force to it, it's only going to have a small acceleration versus the same force applied to a lighter, less massive object that's going to accelerate a lot. So mass, I mean, we, we roughly think of it as a measure of how big something is, but really um, it's a measure of how resistant it is to being accelerated when we apply a force. That's the idea of mass. So we want to have something similar now for rotation. We want a quantity that is the, an object's resistance to being accelerated rotationally. So imagine some object that's on an axis, sort of pivoted maybe somewhere in the middle, and it's at rest, it's static, and we want to sort of get it spinning. So we have to apply some sort of force to it and get it spinning, right? So we want to quantify how hard we have to push. We want to quantify how resistant that object is to to our attempts to rotate it. Okay, and that's called the moment of inertia. The symbol is I. Here we go. Here's the definition. So what we do is um, we think of each little part, each particle that it makes up the object. So this could even be a, like each atom, literally every atom that makes up the object. And the moment of inertia is going to be m times r squared. So it is the mass does factor into it, but then also r squared. r is how far away the the particular particle, the particular atom we're looking at, is from the axis of rotation. That's r. Okay. So you multiply the mass times the square of that distance, and that gives you the moment of inertia. Now what you do then is you do that for all the particles, all the atoms that make up your object, and you just add them up. And that's the overall total moment of inertia. Okay. Now two things about this. One is the units. Well, the units are, well, you can see it's going to be kilograms times meters squared. So those are going to be the units for moment of inertia. And the other thing is, why m times r squared? Like, why is r being squared? Um, what's going on there? What, where does this formula come from? And I have written here that that will be made clear soon, although the first attempt at motivating it, I actually won't be too clear. I won't spell, it, spell all the math out. Um, but I can just say in, in one sentence, basically, this ends up being the right definition to make some future formulas just work. It makes some future concepts just just work. So that's why we define it to be this. Um, and it all under whether I show it to you or not, it's all justified mathematically to be the right thing. And yeah, it just turns out that this is the right combination of quantities that kind of does what we want. All right. Right off the bat, we want to point out that objects don't have one moment of inertia. Objects have one mass, but they don't have one moment of inertia. The thing is, the moment of inertia also depends on an axis of rotation. I'm sorry, let me cover up the example for a second. So if we have a, 
disk and it's spinning around its center so like a record on a record player its moment of inertia will be one thing but if we had a disk the same disk and maybe it's nailed to the wall at a point that's off center a little bit higher up maybe and if we give this a push and swing it around so it kind of lopsidedly rotates around that's going to be a different eye so it's not like the disk has its eye the disk has an eye with respect to the point it's rotating around okay so that's important it's not just this object has an eye it's the object and the, the point that it's rotating around that determine its eye, its moment of inertia. All right. So here's an example of using our formula. Um, what is the moment of inertia for an oxygen molecule about an axis perpendicular to its length? So in a really simplistic model, we, an oxygen molecule is two oxygen atoms. So we can kind of picture it almost like a dumbbell. So here's one oxygen atom, here's another oxygen atom. I'm giving you the mass of the oxygen of each oxygen atom, 2.66 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. And typically, at least at room temperature, the two atoms in an oxygen molecule are separated by about this distance, 1.21 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. All right. Now, what we're imagining is that this thing is spinning and and it says about an axis perpendicular to its length so around this way so that means it's kind of like spinning around this way and this guy's going around the back and it's going around like that okay so kind of like this this molecule is coming out at you excuse me this atom is coming out at you while this atom is going away from you and they go around like that so that's the rotational situation here and we want so we want to work out the moment of inertia all right well the two atoms we can think of those are the two particles and so the overall moment of inertia is going to be m times r squared for each of them added together all right well we have the m both of them have the same m, so m1 and m2 are both going to be this number. And now for the r, again, r in this formula is always how far away you are from the axis of rotation. So you can see that that's half of d, right? That's halfway because the uh, axis is right in the middle. So it's going to be half of this d number that we have. All right, so it's going to be 2.66 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms times, and then we're going to take half of 1.21 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. So cut that in half, and that gets squared. And that's the atom on the left, and the atom on the right is exactly the same, has exactly the same M and R, so I'm just going to double that. And that ends up being uh, 7.79 times 10 to the minus 46 and the units here again are kilograms meters squared so that's the moment of inertia all right now if the question were what is the moment of inertia for an oxygen molecule about an axis along its length so now we have our two oxygen atoms. Here they are connected by a bond. And let's say that the axis cuts through that way. So these guys are kind of spinning around this way. Oops, yeah. <laughs> have them spinning both the same way. OK, yeah. So just kind of spinning on its end like that. All right, well, now you're going to have a different eye. It's not the same thing. Now, we're actually not quite ready to answer this question yet. I have to show you something else, so we'll come back to this. But I just wanted to make the point before we go on that this is going to be a different answer. And so this is driving home the point that I'm saying up here, which is uh, objects don't have one moment of inertia. 
an object and an axis of rotation together have a moment of inertia. So we'll come back to this problem. All right. So yeah, what we have to do before we can answer that second question is, um, OK, so you see like in the first example, we just had two atoms. And it was not hard to just add two mr squareds together. However, if you have an object that has many particles, many objects, many atoms, um, you know, you're not actually going to individually add them up like this. What happens is, and of course we're going to skip the details here, it becomes an integral. You have to integrate. Uh, in fact, it's, it's, it's a multivariable calculus problem. So the results of all those, of those integrals that you can do result in a different moment of inertia for different shapes. And what you see here on this page are some common shapes and what their moment of inertia ends up being after, as I said, a little bit of uh, calculus a little bit of integration. So again, single particle, mr squared. That's the one I already gave you. Okay, it turns out that if you have a solid cylinder or disk, now disk is just a really thin cylinder, of course, right? And I didn't say it here, but as I was just saying, it really it, the axis matters. So I'm talking about an axis that goes through the middle. OK, then it ends up being 1 half times m r squared. The m here is the total mass of the cylinder. And the r here is the outermost radius. It's the, it's the radius of the cylinder. And what that's doing is that's taking into account all the, all the atoms in here and all, of course, throughout. And they all have their own little m. And they all have their own little r their distance from that central axis. And when you add it all up, this is what you get. And again, that comes from an, in an integration that we're not going to go over. So it ends up being a 1 half mr squared. And again, that's true for a disk as well. A disk is just a very flattened cylinder. If the cylinder is hollow um, and like a, a really thin version of that would be a hoop, And again, we're rotating over an axis that goes right through the middle. Uh, you drop the 1 half, and it's actually just mr squared. And the idea here is, well, all that mass is all at the outer edge. So that's actually going to, going to increase the moment of inertia. Um, if the mass is spread out from the center out to the middle for a solid one, then you get one answer. But when all the mass is all at the outer edge, as in a hollow cylinder or a hoop, you end up with a moment of inertia twice as big. Okay. For a solid sphere, and again, our, an, an axis going right through the middle, through the center of the sphere, it ends up being 2 fifths mr squared, r here being the radius of the sphere, and m being the total mass. A hollow sphere, like a shell, like a, like a spherical shell, is 2 thirds mr squared. And again, it's a little bigger. That number is bigger than 2 fifths because same mass, but all that mass is now at the outer edges, and that increases the moment of inertia. All right, and now I'm going to have two formulas for a thin rod. So if we have a thin rod, and we have an axis that just kind of cuts perpendicularly through, so this is kind of rotating around like that, then it's 1 12th ml squared, where l is the length of the rod. If it is a rod that's rotating around an axis along along its length, so just kind of spinning like that, um, that's one half ml squared. So the, this is just going to be a reference list of formulas. If we ever need them in any problem, we will look them up. And this is taken from. Uh, a page in the book. Let me tell you the page. Yeah, it's on page 313. Um, 
there's one or two more on that list in the book as well. So you have this, this is just a reference list and you just look these up as you need them. Again, they all come from some integration which can be done if you take a sort of a Calc 3 class, uh, but we're just going to reference them and use them when we need them. Okay. So, um, if we go back to this problem, what we have here is if we think of these oxygen atoms as spheres, and let's, let's assume they're solid spheres, then yeah, each atom is, is a little sphere rotating around an axis that cuts through its middle. And so we would use the solid sphere formula, 2 fifths mr squared. All right, so, and that's going to be for both of them. So it's going to be 2 fifths m r squared plus another 2 fifths m r squared. And these guys, these two atoms are the same. All right, we have the mass of, of, the ox, of each oxygen molecule. So again, m is, we have m here and here. And now the r in this formula is the radius of the sphere, which is no longer connected to the separation between these two spheres. It's just the radius of the sphere. And so we have to look that up. And I, did, I haven't written that down. And it is something like 155 picometers, so 155 times 10 to the minus 12th meters. So that's the number we'll put in there. OK, so we have 2 fifths, 2.66 times 10 to the minus 26th kilograms. And then we have 155 times 10 to the minus 12th meters squared. And then again, there's two of them, so we just have to double it because it's the same for both. And this gives us a final answer of uh, 5.11 times 10 to the minus 46th kilogram meters squared. So you see it's um, not exactly the same as the moment of inertia that we figured out for the other axis. OK. All right, let's move on then. So that's moment of inertia. That's going to be the sort of replacement value, the replacement quantity for mass. How about force? So you already saw on the chart that we're going to replace it by something called torque. All right, so when a force acts on an object, it actually does two things. It does, you know, based on your basic Newton's second law, F equals MA, it will accelerate the object. Um, or at least it will contribute to the acceleration of the object, depending on the other forces that are acting on it. But it may also sort of independently cause a rotational acceleration. So a force can do two things. This is the one we have already been doing, sort of from chapter 4 and 5. Just your basic force turns into an acceleration and causes the object to possibly to move. Um, but now we're going to deal with the other effect of a force, which is it can also cause it to rotate. A force can cause something to rotate, to accelerate its rotation. All right. But, OK, to, to get a grasp on that, we have to define this new quantity, torque. The symbol for torque is the Greek letter tau, which kind of looks like a kind of a smaller capital T, um, kind of like that if you're handwriting it. So that's called torque. And here's the definition, F times R times sine theta. Let me explain. So F is the magnitude of your force. We know that. R. R is, so let me draw a picture. Let's say we have an object. Here is, it's, it's rotating around its center. And let's say we ha we're applying a force right at a particular point, And there's a force pushing that way. OK, so R is how far away the point where the force is being applied is to the center of rotation. So that's R. OK. And then what's theta? OK, um, let me redraw that arrow a little bit better. OK. So theta is, if you extend the line 
from the center, um, it's this angle. So it, yeah, it's the angle that the force makes with the like the line from the center. That's theta. And so you put these three things together, and that's called the torque. And it turns out that that's going to be the right the right measure for like how the force is affecting the rotation. All right. So let me talk a little bit about that. There are two ways to view the formula for torque. Um, the first way is, let me redraw that picture. OK, so there's theta right there. So if we take the force vector, that arrow, and we break it into components, one going along this line and then the other going perpendicular to the line, kind of a horizontal and vertical thing. Then you can see that it's the the perpendicular guy that is going to be f sine theta. So here's f. f is the actual original vector. And we've split it up. This horizontal piece would be f cosine theta, and this vertical piece would be f sine theta. So in the formula, torque equals f r sine theta. The f and the sine theta together, it's basically the perpendicular component of the force. So it's perpendicular part of the force times r. That's one way to think about it. So this, this right here is the perpendicular component. And that makes sense because that's the part that's going to cause rotation, right? If your force is just in line with the line from the center, like if your force was, if you were applying a force here and it was just straight out, you can see that's not going to cause the object to rotate around this point. If, this, if the object is pivoted right here and nailed down right there, a force that's going in this way is not going to create any rotation. So we would want to say that the torque is zero here. Whereas if you're perfectly perpendicular, if your force is totally perpendicular, that's going to give you the most bang for your buck in terms of causing rotation. So you see that any given force, it's really the perpendicular part of that force that is going to factor into rotation. So that's built into the definition of torque. OK, now there's an alternate way to see this, though, that sometimes is, is easier in a given problem. So again, same situation. Uh, here's the point of application. Here's the force. Now, instead of extending the line from the center, I'm going to extend the line along the force arrow. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line that goes from the center to that line I just drew perpendicularly. So boom. Right, that's going to be perpendicular. And we can label that as D, and that's called the moment arm. Strange name, I know. So moment arm is the distance from the center to the line of the force. Now, remember theta was here? Well, theta is also the same on the other side. And so you see that uh, this is R. We have a little right triangle here. R is the hypotenuse. And D is going to be the opposite side to theta. So D is R sine theta. OK, so in the formula for torque, F R sine theta, we can group the R and the sine theta together. And that's just D. So F D. So this is a different way to look at torque. It's the force, the full force, not a, not a component of it, but the full force. But then you just multiply by the moment arm of it. And like I said, sometimes, sometimes this is a little bit easier to see in a problem. But you see, either way, you get the same answer. It's just like which, 
which guy, F or R, are you going to like attach the sine theta to and interpret it that way? It gives you the same answer, though. All right. To be clear, though, um, if your force is perpendicular to the line from the axis, then that sine theta is going to be 1, and so you don't have to worry about it, and tau is just force times r, force times the distance from the, from the axis. That's sort of one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is if your force is along the line from the axis, then your sine theta will be 0, so there is no torque. So a lot of times in problems, it's one of these two extremes. Okay, but it could be something in the middle, like I've drawn here, where the F is kind of at an odd angle, and then you, ha you do have to take the sine of that angle into account. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip that. Uh, the Finally, I'm going to sort of justify, although I won't show you the math, but this is where the justification would happen. This is the reason for the definition of moment of inertia and for the definition of torque. It's all so that the following works out. We end up with Newton's second law for rotation. And so, of course, Newton's second law original was that the net force was mass times acceleration. Well, now it turns out that you can substitute force, mass, and acceleration. You can put in torque, moment of inertia, and acceleration and this ends up being true. So it's it's like F equals MA before rotation. Net torque is I alpha. And this is the reason we defined I as we did and the reason tau, the torque, got defined as we did. So this ends up working out. Now I'm not going to show you that working out. I'm not going to show you the math behind it. But yes, that's this this ends up being true based on our definitions. Okay, so this is a big, uh, a big result. This is Newton's second law, except applied to rotational motion. So let's do a couple of examples. All right, a disk has mass 0.250 kilograms and a radius of 30 centimeters. A 5.35 Newton force is applied to a point halfway from the center to the edge. So this point right here is halfway along the line, so it would be 15 centimeters along. Okay, what is the angular acceleration? And what I didn't say here, which I'm realizing I should have said, is that this disk is pivoted right in the center. This center is sort of nailed down, but then the disk is free to rotate around it. And that matters. If there's some other point, we'd have to do something different. Okay. All right, so the idea is, okay, this force is going to correspond to a torque. Um, oh, and I also realized that I did not specifically say what the angles were here. Um, I meant this angle to be 45 degrees. Okay. Yeah, I didn't say that, did I? No, I did not. So 45 degree angle. Also, that has to be given in the problem. All right. Um, Great. So that means that torque is uh, F times R times sine theta. And we have everything. We have 5.35 Newtons times, and the R here is from the center to the point of application of the force, so 15 centimeters, so 0 0.150 meters, and then times the sine of 45 degrees. I'll make it be three significant figures. Okay. And that works out to be 0 0.567. Um, oh, and what are the units? I never said what the units of torque were. Force is in newtons, r is in meters, and sine theta is unitless. So the torque is in newton meters. Newton meters. Okay. So the torque is 0.567 newton meters. Um, by the way, the torque also is in the counterclockwise direction. We can see that this force is going to cause um, an acceleration, a rotational acceleration this way, right? It won't go the other way. So, yeah, we torque also has a direction, but it's either it's one of two directions. It's either clockwise or counterclockwise. 
All right, so then we go to Newton's second law, net torque. And by the way, this is the only force we're told about, so that's the only torque. This guy right here is I alpha. So alpha is net torque over moment of inertia. So 0 0.567 Newton meters divided by, OK, and now we need the moment of inertia. Now, we have a disk. Its mass is, two, is 0 0.250 kilograms. Its radius is 30 centimeters. We look up on our chart of different shapes the moment of inertia for a disk. Oops, there we go. Disk, or solid cylinder, 1 half m r squared. Great. So the moment of inertia is 1 half m r squared, where the r here, and I'm using capital R, is the full radius of the disk, not the little r, which applies to where the force is being exerted upon. All right, so 1 half. 0.250 kilograms, 0 0.300 meters squared. And that gives us uh, 0.01125 kilograms meters squared. All right, so that goes in right here, 01125 kilograms meters squared to give us a final answer of 50.4. And this will be in radians per second squared, which you can check if you want. You remember Newtons are uh, kilograms meters per second squared. And then we have another meter here, so kilograms meters squared per second squared. And you see we're dividing by kilograms and meters squared. So boom, 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 boom. So we're just left with seconds squared in the denominator right there. Radians is a unitless thing, so radians per second squared is OK. But that's the answer. 50.4 radians per second squared is going to be the angular acceleration. Um, yeah. And then from there, we could now do some kinematic questions. Like if this disk started not rotating, so with an, with an angular velocity of 0, we could you know, go from there and figure out what, how fast it'll be spinning after a few seconds or whatever. We could figure out how far it will have spun, how many radians or how many revolutions it could have spun after you know 10 seconds or something like that so we could take it from there once you get the acceleration you're set okay so uh, we'll stop this video now um, and we'll uh, either have a, another video or we'll pick up in lecture from here and we'll start maybe we'll do another example of this and we will also uh, talk about energy and momentum, the other two uh, approaches to working out mechanics.